Hey guys. Hello. How are you going? How's how's it going over there? Everybody everybody happy? Everybody ready for a great talk? Okay. Guys. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Th thanks so much for joining. Um, I'll introduce you here. This is um, so we've got uh, Jack Cornish from the Ramblers, and we've got Dan Ormsby and Matt Walker from Aston Technology. Um, and so these guys have partnered up to uh, develop a huge crowdsourcing campaign to map paths in the UK. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to Jack. I think you're starting first. And are we going to? keep all you on the screen at the same time here, or will we sort of rotate in and out? Don't mind. Fine by me, whatever works best, John. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll put up your screen, I'll jump out and you go ahead. Okay, over to you. Okay, yeah, well, thanks for having us today. I think I'm, I'm kicking off, um, just setting some context um, to the project, and then uh, we'll hand over and talk a bit about the technology behind it. So if we could look at the first slide. So um, I work at the Ramblers and the Ramblers is Britain's walking charity. So we safeguard paths across England and Wales and Scotland. And we've done so for 80 odd years now. And in England and Wales, we've got an amazing network of public paths, about 140,000 miles of them. They're all legally recorded and they tell you what you can do on them. You know, so footpaths, you can walk, bridleways, you can ride a bike and, and uh, ride on horseback. And they stretch out across the country, not just in rural landscapes, but in towns and cities as well. And they give the public the right to access those, those paths. And these are all legally recorded um, with local government bodies on what's called the definitive map. So. There's actually 137 definitive maps and they record where the public has the right to, as I say, to walk, to cycle, to ride a horse. And it's an amazing network and it's a network of great history as well. Some of these paths go back hundreds, if not thousands of years, and they're still used for their original purpose to, to access our amazing natural landscapes. We have the, the next slide. Oops, a bit slow. <laughs> um, so these um, these legal rights of way, were, they've been around for generations, but they were first legally recorded in um, uh, from the nineteen from nineteen forty five onwards. And local local um, government bodies had to put together these these maps of uh, of legal rights of way. But we know that that was an incomplete process, and actually we know that there are thousands of miles of of rights of way that the public should be able to access that are missing from those maps. And the talk today is about how we identified those missing rights of way. And back in the year 2000, under the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, um, the, the then government set a deadline to actually find these missing rights of way, find these missing public paths, and to um, identify them and then do historical research to apply for them to be added back to the definitive map. So this is a process of getting something that's called a definitive map and actually making it definitive. And we've actually only got, as of now, four years and three months to, to do this. Um, if we can come to the next slide. So Don't Use Your Way is all about supporting volunteers to identify where these, where these lost paths are and to support them in collecting historical evidence to, um, to put them back on the map. That historical evidence can be, it can, back, can go back to 1189. That is the legal date in English law of time memorial. That's the legal date of, of, of legal time. And so we can use evidence that goes back, you know, getting on for a thousand years to prove that these paths were used by the public in the past and therefore they should be used now. And volunteers will collect that evidence and then they'll make a case to the local government that these paths should be added back onto the map and they should be used and enjoyed for hundreds of years to come. Next slide, please. So the main challenges that the Ramblers face and that, and that everyone faces with, with, with actually getting these paths back on the map so they can be open again is, first of all, finding out where they are. You know, we've got 140,000 miles of recorded rights of way, but 
how many miles of, of unrecorded rights of way are there? How do you solve that problem? And where do we actually, how do you actually identify where they are? And then there's also a challenge, which is we're asking volunteers to, you know, once we found these rights of way to get involved in quite a detailed bit of volunteering. They need to, you know, each path application is essentially like a, a mini research project. So they they need to put together lots of different historical documents to make the case that a path was, was used by the public in the past and therefore it should be used now. So that's one of the big challenges of it. And actually having the path identified helps with that because it really brings it to life and, and makes it really tangible for people. And also with, with the, the deadline in 2026 coming up with, with just over four years left to, to, to get these rights of way applied for, we also need to be able to prioritise within that. We need to understand, are there parts of the country or are there parts, you know, even of, of an area within the country that have many more unrecorded rights of way than others? Where can we focus our efforts the best to, um, to actually make the most of this opportunity to improve our walking and cycling network long into the future? So those were the three biggest challenges. And we worked with Aston to 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 hopefully address some of those, and I think Dan's going to talk now through how we did that. Thanks, Jack. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk through a little bit um, about the the, the process, um, the overall project, uh, and some of the tools we developed on it. Um, Matt's going to do a bit more of a sort of technical deep dive at the end uh, in terms of what you know what we actually built in terms of the OS um, geo technology. Um, but we'll have a little look first of all, as I say, the overall process. So uh, the process started really with um, uh, capturing the attention really of uh, the volunteers. We needed to, to recruit this um, body of volunteers who could get involved in the project. Um, and Jack and his colleagues at the Ramblers did a very successful job in um, promoting it and generating interest by featuring on national television and in national press and on the BBC radio and in newspaper print like the Times and the Guardian and so on to really kind of get people engaged in the process. And as a result of that, managed to recruit three and a half thousand volunteers who all signed up to, uh, to the platform. Um, we then took um, the country and we, we, we chopped it up into 150,000 different one kilometer squares. And when a volunteer logged in, they would effectively be able to either choose a square they might be interested in or, or be randomly assigned one. Uh, and essentially, the idea was that they would go and, and, and scrutinize these, these squares of mapping and try and find these lost paths. Um, and there are various things done in the tool to try and make that a, a fun and engaging process by gamifying it a little bit in terms of statistics of, of, of who's found how many and where they were in a leaderboard, so to speak. Um, and it was a fun activity. And, and, and actually, it happened in February 2020 when uh, over in the UK, we were starting to go into various lockdowns due to the pan pandemic. Uh, and it was something that people did and could do from the comfort of their, their own home. So once they'd logged in and you'd um, been assigned a square, you'd be presented with a, a, a user interface uh, web-based mapping interface that we built using open layers uh, at the front end and, and post just at the back end. And essentially what this user interface did was split the screen in two uh, with uh, contemporary mapping on, uh, on one side of the screen and historic mapping uh, on the other side of the screen. What we're having a look at, at here is on the left-hand side, you'll see um, the Ordnance Survey mapping, the Ordnance Survey of the, the National Mapping Agency in the UK. And on the right hand side, you will see um, some uh, historic mapping. And there's a slider bar that essentially allows the users to uh, swipe between one and the other and, and, and essentially look to kind of spot the difference between the two. Um, we'll have a little look at that now. I've got a, a, a short video. Um, it, this was actually from uh, the talk we did last year at the Fossil G UK. Um, where we, we did a demonstration of that. So if I just play that now, hopefully you'll be able to um, get a feel for this. But what you'll see is as we swipe right, you can see the green footpaths uh, marked on the current map. Uh, as we swipe to the left, there are some highlighted symbols, footpath symbols there that are showing ones that are on the historic map that aren't on, on the current map. And we're asking the users to spot the difference, to try and find those that they can see uh, on the old maps that aren't present on the new one uh, and then capture them. 
Uh, and you can see what we're doing here. I'm, I'm drawing a line down um, the right hand side of, uh, of that lake um, to uh, effectively to digitize that path that isn't on the contemporary map. Um, and we go through this process a few times. Um, you can uh, essentially probably get the gist of it from, um, from looking at that. And at the end of that process, the, the user may well end up with something that looks a little bit like this. So here are all the various paths that they've, uh, they've captured, um, including actually one that is in error at the top. And we'll have a little look at, uh, at that in a minute. Um, and what they would do is submit that square and then be moved on to, a, to another square of the country uh, or be able to choose another one that, you know, that, that they're interested in. Um, so that was the, the capture process, and that was repeated uh, over 150,000 squares. Uh, and it was, in fact, repeated twice. So uh, each volunteer, uh, or sorry, each square was reviewed by two volunteers. And then there was a third volunteer uh, who would effectively do a verification process, some kind of quality assurance on that square. And that's what we're looking at here is the, is the quality assurance interface and what that allowed the verifiers to do was to firstly sort of do QA in terms of looking at the accuracy of the path and checking where you're checking whether it was actually one that was missing or you know hadn't been captured in error, um, make any corrections to the, the, the accuracy of the geometry, but to pick which you know effectively pick which one of those two volunteers might have have done the best job on capturing those paths. The other important point about that process was that allowed any intentional bias to be to be ruled out of the process. So for example, you might have landowners who would rather not have a path being reinstated across their private land. And, and, and it allowed that, that combination of two volunteers and the verifier to ensure that there was uh, no sort of, um, as I say, kind of in, in, incorrect or misrepresentation of what the actual situation was. So that was the verification process. And at the end of this, it was you know quite astounding what was actually found um, there were nearly 50,000 miles worth of paths found, 49,138. So that would actually be adding nearly, uh, well, over a third as much again onto the existing network if all of those were reinstated. So, you know, very large uh, length, very large volume of paths. And there were also some interesting statistics. Uh, there was one uh, volunteer who clearly got so engaged with it that they ended up capturing 21,000 squares, so just an, an astonishing amount of, uh, of, of, of work there. Um, that's obviously a bit higher than most. Most of the average were around about 40 or 50 squares, somewhere between the two uh, that people were getting engaged with. So you know, lots of, um, you know, really kind of quite exciting results came out of that. Following on from that, we've still got now a, a, a network, but it's chopped up into these one kilometer squares. And we had to go through a process of joining that and stitching that back together again. Um, so we used the QGIS um, processing toolbox and some of the tools within uh, PostGIS as well, and came up with a flow line that involved um, buffering the lines and making the buffers a bit bigger at the end of the line and joining them all together and then pulling out the effectively the center lines at the end. And what that did was that ended up leaving us with a nice kind of clean topological network, nicely, nicely captured topological network that could be used for the next stage in, in, in the process. Um, that's quite a simplified view of it. The, the model was quite a lot more complicated than that, but um, you know, really good bit of um, interesting spatial analysis um, to, to, to do in that stage. Um, finally, this is where we are at at the moment. So uh, we're going through a uh, prioritization phase. So this again is another um, cohort of volunteers, about 900 volunteers I think are involved in this. And essentially the purpose here is to try and determine which paths add most value to the network because some will do more so than others. So for example, there might be paths that join up a circular route or connect to a coastal path or a long distance national path, uh, which would really be fantastic if they were reinstated. And there are others that may be less so, you know, where they perhaps have been already diverted, you know, uh, around perhaps the edge of a field instead of going across across the middle of it. So what we want to try and do is to um, is, to, is to, to go through and prioritize each path and decide you know, what value it actually adds through to the network. And that's essentially what's happening at the moment. Um, so I so say we've got about 900 volunteers involved in that. Um, I think I'm going to hand back to Jack briefly now just to talk through what happens next. And then we'll give uh, Matt the stage to talk through some of the underlying technology. 
Yeah, so so the next stage really is we 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 having the the map of those lost paths is really the the central point for all of our future volunteering and the next stage is we'll get volunteers to actually say I want to research that particular path that's in my community in my village in my town and then give them the tools to be able to build up the historical evidence a lot of which is historic maps and plans and but also other other historical documents to give a picture and what they're trying to demonstrate is that the public used that path in the past and if they used it in the past any point in the last 900 or so years then they should be able to use it now so i suppose what i'm trying to say is we'll really have at the heart of it the map that we produce and it won't just be a data set that we produce but it will be it will be an ongoing living thing that will really uh really sort of push forward our volunteering for this and getting volunteers to, to help putting these paths back on the map uh, if we just quickly look at the next slide so there's there's quite a, a, a process to go through once an app once uh, once that historical research has been done but essentially to say that it is it's submitted to to the local government body and they look at it and they see is there enough evidence to show that the public uses in the past and then it has to then go out for objections advertised to the public and there can be various legal processes that happen after this but essentially the really important thing for us is to to get more volunteers involved using the map, get more volunteers involved. So those applications are submitted before the 1st of January, 2026, because if, as long as they're submitted before then, we can make sure that they will be looked at and that hopefully these paths will be will be reinstated for, for future generations. So I think Matt's now gonna talk through some of the underlying tech behind this all. Hi, yeah, thanks. Uh, so primarily we're talking about a, a web application um, that was uh, delivered uh, to allow people to use it um, easily from their own homes. Um, and there's uh, a bunch of um, ETLs that extract, transform, load, load processes um, behind the scenes. Um, one of the principles that we um, were looking to adhere to was to provide a really great user experience, but quite a lot of effort um, into understanding what the users need and um, try and make a, a user interface that encourages contribution um, and also guides users through through the tasks. Uh, all had to be reliable and handle some spikes in load. You had some particularly large spikes initially um, following the uh, the PR campaign, um, getting on national television, generates quite a lot of uh, lot of interest. Um, and the whole um, solution is hosted on um, AWS, so that's Amazon Web Services in their cloud environment. Uh, right at the middle of the, the diagram, um, and the heart of it really is the, the database. So there's a Postgres 11 database using uh, PostGIS. Um, that's a AWS RDS um, server, which has served us very well. During the early stages, uh, we had that auto scaling with um, Aurora. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, lower numbers of users and have scaled back to a, a plain old RDS, which is um, working just well. Um, in that database, we've got the core project data, so things like the paths, their priority, um, and in future, things like the, the applications that individuals have uh, decided to research, um, as well as a whole bunch of reference data um, and project statistics. Um, where appropriate, we've made use of the, the functionality within in Postgres and, and PostGIS. So for doing things like um, statistics and um, to su support a bunch of the application logic via either regular or materialized views and triggers and the likes. Um, we're big fans of Postgres and PostGIS and like to make the most of it where we can. Uh, we also utilize um, some row level auditing um, to keep track of changes uh, of the data throughout the, the project lifecycle. Uh, down the bottom, we've got the um, ETL components, of which there are uh, a fair few. Uh, so we have ETL, uh, which uses tools like GDAL and OGR for, for raster and vector processing. Um, we use uh, a bunch of Python scripts to coordinate things, um, and tools like the, the uh, CLI for all, um, AWS to both um, coordinate the environment and also um, move data around. Uh, most of the ETLs are um, concerned with uh, data preparation, uh, but we also have a number of scheduled jobs for things like gathering statistics and also making data available to um, platforms like Tableau, which the Ramblers use internally um, to provide some um, data dashboards, those sorts of things. Um, over on the other side, um, we've got uh, some base mapping and um, a vector data. So the base mapping is obviously an important um, aspect of the project. 
Um, so Dan mentioned we're using Ordnance Survey, um, so this current mapping that you might find on a walking map, say, which details the existing um, footpath network, plus historic data from both the Ordnance Survey um, and Bartholomew, um, kindly provided by the National Library of Scotland. Um, and we've used um, technology such as uh, Map Proxy um, to help us configure and define the uh, the tile sets that are needed in development, um, serve those develop uh, dynamically during development, uh, and then create static tile sets, which we host over on, on S3 um, via CloudFront for, for production um, to keep the, uh, the performance um, as good as it can be. I mentioned vector data, we've got some reference data. So we've served out some vector tiles for things like footpath and bridle route um, labels, which are extracted from another project that looked to um, copy the, the, uh, the labels off of historic maps, um, which we uh, are now making use of within our project. Um, and then somewhere um, on the other side, over on the, the right, you've got uh, the web APIs, which kind of bind it all together and um, provide the, the functionality up to the client. Uh, so we're using Auth0 there for authentication, which is used um, corporately at, at the Ramblers. Many volunteers um, will already have an Auth0 account. Um, and they'll be able to then use that to also access the Don't Use Your Way site, which is fantastic. And we're using um, Aston's iShare Cloud Platform, uh, which provides uh, a number of web mapping APIs uh, for drawing and querying um, and then updating the, the map data, um, plus your standard OGC um, WMS, WFS um, web services too. Um, and we also use that for configuration, so things like styling and um, configuring the layers that um, appear in a particular map view, those sorts of things. One last component is uh, up in the client, um, which is in many ways the most important because it's what the, the end user sees. Um, so we've got a series of web maps which are built on, uh, on open layers. Um, we've had a number of different uh, web maps um, throughout the project. So a map to allow you to choose a, a particular grid square to work on, uh, the, the map to allow you to compare and identify maps. Uh, and currently we've got a map called the volunteer map, which allows you to prioritize paths, um, provide certain um, users with uh, high enough privilege to edit map um, paths and uh, later on to coordinate the, the coordination process. Um, I think that's pretty much us, us for time. I mean. Hopefully, that's given you a view of the project in total and uh, some of the technology behind it. Um, I, I, Aston's been involved in um, contributing and using um, open source uh, projects through OSGO for, for many years. And uh, really, it's just a, a been a pleasure to be able to de develop a project like this, which is um, ha has greater um, use and benefit to the society as a whole, built on the tools that um, OSGO develop as a community. Um, if anyone who would like to get involved, uh, learn more, um, then the website address is on that last slide there. Uh, so don't lose your way um, and you can find some more information and as I say, um, even get involved, view the map and uh, help out in the process. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Great talk. Great story. Yeah. Th thank you so much for sharing. We've got, um, we don't have a lot of time for questions, so I'll just jump right into them. Um, We've got one, one person asks, great project. Do you have a clear view of what evidence will be needed to persuade the decision makers? Will they take account of your priority setting? So they they won't take account of priority setting because the decision has to be made on the evidence, which actually helps us because it means a decision can't be made because they don't want the path there. So there are really standard set of historical maps and plans that are, that are in most applications. Um, and we, we're developing guidance for volunteers on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, next question, is there any plan or process for adding the reinstated historic paths to ordnance survey network data? Should I pick that up? I can, I can take that. <laughs> you go, Dan. Yeah, so um, the ordnance survey um, essentially get their data from the local government, uh, local authorities, local governing bodies. So um, the process of us applying uh, to, or the volunteers applying to the local authority to have a path reinstated means that it gets added to the definitive map of that for that local authority. And then when the ordnance survey come round to revising their particular map sheets, 
they go to um, the particular local authority in question and go and get um, a, a copy of their definitive map. So it, it wouldn't be directly from this project to the Ordnance Survey, but it, yes, it will get through that process. Okay, great. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question here. So um, have you thought about training, this is kind of an interesting one, have you, have you thought about training an AI with the geodata from all those manually annotated tiles and the ancient raster map data? This could, be, this could boost future similar campaigns by pre-processing of such historic raster maps. I think we thought about some of that sort of approach before the project, um, but I guess what we haven't done is actually thought about retrospectively using the data to train historic maps uh, or, to, or to train a AI process to, um, to do that. Uh, but that sounds like a very interesting, interesting project. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think we'll we'll leave it there unless you have anything else you want to share just before signing off. All good? That's great. Okay, well, yeah, th thanks so much. Really appreciate you sharing the story and uh, yeah, best of luck with with it and then in the in the next phase. All right. Thanks guys. Thanks all. Goodbye. Okay. Okay, we're gonna take a few minutes break here and we'll be back shortly with uh, Dustin Carlino.